All right, it's the top of the hour. I wanted to welcome everyone uh, to our webinar today on Refson's disease from an ophthalmology perspective. I'm Christy DeMarco, uh, the founder and president of Global Dare Foundation, and I'll be your host today. We're honored to be joined by Dr. Bart Leroy, uh, the head of, of the Department of Ophthalmology and staff member at the Center for Metab for Medical Genetics and at Gent, Gent, Gent University and Ghent University Hospital, where he has been working since 2001. He is also a full professor of ophthalmology and ophthalmic genetics at Gent University. Since uh, 2013, Bart has also had a part-time position uh, as an attending physician at the Division of Ophthalmology and Center of Cellular and Molecular Therapeutics at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. Bart is an ophthalmologist and clinical geneticist at specializing in heritable retinal eye disorders and symptomatic conditions affecting the eye. Um, before we get started and I hand it over to Bart, I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about Global Dare Foundation and give you a few housekeeping details. So Global Dare Foundation was established in two October 2019. DARE stands for De De Defeat Adult Refsum Everywhere. Our mission is to promote worldwide awareness and better quality of life for those who are diagnosed with adult Refsum disease. Our goal is to support research, education initiatives, awareness campaigns, advocacy. Driving research is at the center of what we do because we dare to believe that there's a cure for adult Refsum disease. BART is, a, is supporting our Global DARE Foundation mission by being a valued member of our Medical and Scientific Advisory Board. With BART and others on our MSAB, we are raising awareness for Refsum driving better treatment and care, and reinvigorating the research into better therapies for Refsum's disease. Before uh, I hand it over, uh, I wanna give you a few housekeeping details. So all participants are in listen-only mode. Uh, there's a few ways you'll be able to ask questions. Uh, participants uh, following in on, on Zoom can type their questions in the Q&A box at any time during the presentation or raise their hand by pressing Alt-Y or using their keyboard. Uh, participants on, uh, calling in can press star 9 on their phone to raise their hand. After, after the presentation, I'll be moderating the questions with BART. I will start by uh, asking the questions from the Q&A box in Zoom, then to the dial-in participants, and then to the online participants. Today's session will be recorded for later viewing on the Global DARE Foundation website. All right, Bart, so I'm gonna hand it over to you now. Let me switch to your first, there you go. So thank you, thank you so much, uh, Christy, and uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, I can see that we are already quite a crowd and growing. Um, and uh, let me be also very clear, the interest of us all is that you do understand me. So if I do not speak up enough, um, please let us know through the chat box. I'm sure that Christy will interrupt me if I start talking um, in, in a voice that is too low, um, because obviously we are interested in um, getting the information through. So the, the, the goal that we have with the webinar is today to talk about the ophthalmological features in adult Refsum disease. How does uh, adult Refsum disease present itself at the level of the eye? And also quite importantly, how does an ophthalmologist help to make a diagnosis? Um, I'm a learner myself, and I'll illustrate that during the talk, how I came, uh, became to, to be interested, uh, came to be interested in, in, in adult Refsum disease and how I noticed that I had missed the diagnosis. Um, and through telling the story, I want to wake up eye doctors and other doctors, as well as patients, uh, that there are a couple of features that you can help uh, yourself, yourselves with to make a proper diagnosis. So can I have the next slide, please? Um, this is um, 
a, a slide that will tell us where I um, have financial disclosures. So in general, people like me, genetic eye doctors are uh, far and few between. Um, and we do a lot of consultancy for companies where we help develop medications, we advise them. Um, I, for one, do not take any money myself. Uh, all proceedings in compensation of my um, consultancy goes into research accounts that I support research with. Um, next slide. <clears throat> so I'll be introducing the topic of what are eyes and genes, then specifically a little word on uh, adult restroom disease. I'll carry on with examples and actually show you some results of a tiny study that we did and then overall conclude what we need to take home from this talk. Next slide, please. So next one. So humans are defined by genes. We all are very complex machines. And I think that it suffices to say that 20,000 genes from your father and 20,000 genes from your mother define you as a person. How so? Well, every cell in your body contains a copy of 20,000 genes from both parents. And the combination thereof makes you into this unique individual that you are. Indeed, sperm cells and egg cells are the only two types of cells that just have one set of 20,000 uh, genes. And obviously these then combine to be the novel individual that each of, uh, each of us is. In general, those 20,000 genes times two, we know three or seven of them currently as being involved in retinal disease, that is disease at the back of the eye and the eye nerve. Over 270 are known at the level of structure. And so we can look at them in detail. Next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> how do you compare chromosomes? And some of you may have heard about chromosomes and genes. Well, chromosomes are far larger bodies of genetic material onto which are arranged those 20,000 genes uh, times two. And so we get in the sperm cell from, far, from our father, 23 chromosomes, on them, 20,000 genes. And 23 chromosomes is coming from our mother as well, with again, a set of 20,000 um, genes. Genes individually cannot be seen through a microscope, whereas chromosomes can. Now we need to know about inheritance a little bit to understand what's going on in Refsum disease. I'm not going to go into much detail. Suffice it to say that adult Refsum disease is what we call an autosomal recessive condition. What is meant by this is that from father and mother, a bad gene comes and they don't know that they're carriers of this bad copy of the gene. And by chance, both of them put it into their egg or sperm cell. And the combination thereof is a child with two bad copies of a certain gene. This is independent of the sex of an individual. So whether you're female or male doesn't really matter. Next slide, please. So let's zoom into the eye very quickly. The eye works as a camera. And at the end of the day, the, the important bit in the eye, the most important bit in the eye is at the back. It is the inner lining of the eye globe, which is the, you could say, wallpaper of the eye. And that is called the retina. Next slide. Now here you see, and I'm going to be very plastic in my descriptions, that is, I'm going to go into details for those of you who don't have good vision and who are online following my talk. The photograph that I'm showing is at the back of an eye, looking at the central part of the retina, which is the light sensitive part of the back of the eye. It is the wallpaper that really does the job of seeing. We have a central part, 
which is responsible for high acuity vision. That is, you recognize your partner, your kids, your friends, your family members with that central part. You can read a newspaper, you can see signs uh, with that central part. For the rest, you also have a side part to the retina responsible for your broadness or vision, or you better said, your visual fields. Okay, next slide. Now, the human retina, just like for any animal on Earth that has vision, is actually that part of the eye that translates light into electrical signals. And that is essential if you want to understand what's going on in adult refsum disease in, at the level of the eye. So we have this specialized part of the eye, which is the retina, that translates light stimuli into little electrical impulses. The latter then go through the eye nerve, which is an electrical cable going to the back of your brain where you realize you interpret what you see. Next slide. Now the human retina has a, little, has a, a, a specific structure to it. And the cartoon that I'm showing here is showing you at the bottom of the slide cells that we call photoreceptor cells. We have rods and these cells have a rod-like part and these rods are hypersensitive to light and give us night vision. We all know that night vision is not as good as is daytime vision. Night vision allows us to navigate at night but it doesn't give us sharp vision, it doesn't give us color vision but it does help us. We also have cones and cones are cells that require more light to fall upon them for them to function and then translate that light into electrical signals. If they do so, they give you high acuity vision. They give you color vision because we have three types, the more blue, the more green and the more red sensitive families of cones. So cones for daytime vision and rods for nighttime vision, both are called together the photoreceptors of the eye, the light sensitive cells of the eye. The rest of the anatomy or build of the retina, I can actually summarize by saying you've got middle retinal cells and inner retinal cells. The rods and the cones sit more in the outer part and they're themselves supported by a very important layer called the pigment epithelium of the retina, a very important supportive layer. Now, the electricity made in the rods at night in the cones during the day gets relayed into the cells in the middle and they relay the electrical activity into the inner retinal cells. Uh, and these latter inner retinal cells make the eye nerve going to the back of the brain. So basically two things are important here for us to understand refsum disease, the rods and the cones on the one hand as photoreceptors and on the other hand the pigment cells just beneath them that support them in their function. The other cells are relay cells that are of less importance in Refsum disease. Next slide, please. So rods and cones, we have many more rods, suffice it to say 120 million, and of the cones, we just have 6 million. Yes, 120 million cells give us night vision per retina, and only 6 million cones do that job when we're in bright daylight. Next slide. And again, a structure of the retina, I'm going to pass through that. Next slide. And again, I'm going to pass through that because I've said all this. And then I'm going to just have a word or two about what retinitis pigmentosa is. And I'm going to come to adult refsum disease. All of you know that retinitis pigmentosa is part of this. And I'll come back to that later. But what is retinitis pigmentosa really? Retinitis pigmentosa 
as a genetic eye doctor, I see most of the time as an isolated condition. That is, the patient doesn't have anything else but the problem that we call retinitis pigmentosa. Now, retinitis pigmentosa is a very bad name for that disease. It stems from 1869, which is a long time ago, admittedly, and people didn't know genes back then and thought it was an inflammatory condition, hence retinitis, like tendinitis, arthritis, etc. We now know that retinitis pigmentosa is not inflammatory in its origin. It is genetic in its origin. What is retinitis pigmentosa? It is a rod cone disease. Why I'm saying rod dash cone disease is because the rods don't function first, then they die. And because the rods don't function and then start dying, they pull the cones with them in death. And what you'll see in a patient is first complaints of night blindness because the rods don't function anymore. As the rods start dying, what you then get in the periphery where the rods are incredibly high in number, they pull into death the cones that are less in number into death with them. And what you get is then in a second stage after the night blindness, also during daylight, restriction of the visual field. That is progressive tunnel vision. And people start bumping into stuff when they have this stage of disease. And in the end, it ends up with a small tunnel into which you see just with your remaining cones. Indeed, in the center of the retina, the cones are in very high numbers. And actually the very center only contains cones. And that's where these cones defend themselves against cell death. But in some patients, vision is completely lost. Now, next slide, please. So we have all kinds of types of retinitis pigmentosa, dominant, recessive, sex-linked, where males are affected, females far less. Next slide. Uh, I can show you a slide here where you see on the right-hand side a fundus picture of the back of the eye in a patient with rhodopsin-related dominant retinitis pigmentosa. And what you see in the periphery is quality loss with pigment into the retina. And that is the retinal pigment epithelium that starts to try up and that, to try and clean up what is left of debris dies into that process and actually liberates its pigment. And therefore you see those pigmentary signs in the periphery, which really is some sort of scar tissue formation. The patient here has a much better central retina, just like people with Refsum disease. Next slide, please. There are so many genes and I'm not gonna go into these, there's a total of 23 for dominant retinitis pigmentosa. Next slide. There's a total of 43 for recessive retinitis pigmentosa. Next slide. And there are still more for X-linked disease, at least two, and we think there might be more. What I've done up to now, I've introduced you to genes. I've introduced you to the eye. I've then said what retinitis pigmentosa was. I've said that retinitis pigmentosa is actually a condition that is mostly isolated, but sometimes we do see it as part and parcel of a larger syndrome, which means a condition where retinitis pigmentosa is not the only condition. There are other conditions, there are other problems in the patient, and together we then call it a syndrome. One of them is adult Refsum disease. Next slide. So adult Refsum disease, next slide, is a condition that we all know, and most of you on the line, and if you don't, well, thank you for being here and learning. Sigvald Refsum in 1946 as a Norwegian neurologist described the combination of retinitis pigmentosa, peripheral polyneuropathy, which means nerve disease in the periphery of the body, 
cerebellar ataxia, which really means balance issues due to the smaller brain, the cerebellum, not working perfectly. And he also noticed that people, when having a spinal tap at the back of at the back, um, when they they push a needle into the back, they saw that there was more protein present in that fluid than normal. Next slide, please. So additional signs of adult Refsum disease are sensory neural hearing loss, most of the time coming later in life, pupillary abnormalities, that is the pupils do not get wide as, as easily in many of the patients. Some pa people have, and people uh, have described 30% of the patients as having this, have short uh, fingers or toes, um, mostly due to the fact that the root uh, bones in your hands and your feet can be shorter. Most of the time, the fourth uh, ray of the hand or the foot, so the fourth toe or the fourth finger. Uh, the heart can suffer. And one thing that is fairly frequent and maybe more frequent than I'm mentioning here, nobody's really looked recently is anosmia, the absence of the sense of smell. Some people also have dry scaly skin. Next slide. The retinitis pigmentosa comes with the classic signs that I previously discussed. Night blindness, then constriction of the visual fields, which means tunnel vision development because of cone death also during the daytime, people start bumping into stuff. And then in the end, sometimes even earlier than the end of the disease, there's a decrease of the central vision, the sharp vision. In the eyes, we also have pupillary abnormalities. The iris can be of lesser quality and the lens can be opaque um, or cloudy much more uh, rapidly than classically seen in the older individuals. And this is called cataract. Next slide, please. Now, Refsum disease is an autosomal recessive condition, which means that of a gene called um, uh, PHYH, which encodes for an enzyme called phytanoyl coenzyme A hydroxylase, if you have a problem in the gene coming from mummy and in the gene from daddy, you have a mutation in both, you do not produce that enzyme. Now that enzyme, that protein has a function as an enzyme and it really breaks down a very unusual fatty acid for it to then be able to degenerate further afterwards. Now, if that enzyme is insufficiently active or not active at all, you accumulate what is called phytanic acid, that very fatty acid that cannot be broken down by the enzyme. In the eye, amongst other places, we think that there's an accumulation of phytanic acid in the pigment cells of the retina, which support rods and cones. Next slide, please. So, the eye problems oftentimes bring the patient to the eye doctors. And I'm going to tell my own story. But first, as adult Refsum disease is a very rare disease with an estimated frequency of about one in a million. And actually, we don't really know. We do know that it's incredibly infrequent. So it's a really rare disease. But the problem is that it is underdiagnosed. It's often diagnosed when it is diagnosed far too late in the evolution of the condition. And if we can help through doing this webinar, one or two patients even, we, are, we have won. We hope obviously to reach many more patients. And I'm quoting from a paper um, from 1992, but if only the eye doctor would see, there's an average delay of 11 years between the patient presenting to the eye doctor and then finally being diagnosed as having Refsum disease. And this is far too long. We need to improve on that. Next slide, please. So um, other issues that I wanted to mention is that this condition can be treated. There's no real treatment for it in the sense that you can't give them medication to stop the Refsum disease from happening. 
But what we do know is that we have the power to reduce the sources of phytonic acids in the diet of a patient with adult Refsum disease. And we do know that the neurological evolution and the dermatological evolution, so nerve and skin symptoms, do improve when you give a diet. And we do believe that we also might have some influence on the retinal function. So the eye disease may evolve slower when we have the diagnosis early and can reduce the phytanic acid through a specific diet. Next slide, please. So I did a little study, and this is years ago, and I haven't published this officially, but I want to participate. I want you to participate in this talk by looking at the data. I'm currently working with a young trainee in Ghent in Belgium who is helping me to get these data out and to add additional data accumulated since. What we did was we wanted to study the eye problems in patients uh, in more detail. And part of this study was done when I was in training between 1998 and 2001, which tells me I'm very old already, but anyway, I'm still going. Next slide. So 12 Caucasian patients were part of this study. Uh, eight were British, three were Belgian, one was Dutch. There were seven men and five women involved with a mean age of diagnosis of 28 years. But if you see the spread, it's between 16 and 37. And we really ought to do better. Uh, the mean age of the first symptoms was approximately 16 years. Um, and uh, nine patients, that is, people were 16 approximately when they started having signs and symptoms. And this is very important because they were missed. Um, next slide, please. And what I'm going to do is take you through examples from that study. I'm not going to go into detail about the study. I'm just going to show you a couple of examples. Next slide, please. So this is a first patient. And this is the first patient I ever came across in my life. I was this young guy. I trained as a genetic a geneticist. I had trained as an ophthalmologist and I was about to go to uh, train with Professor Alan Bird at Moorfields Eye Hospital in London in the UK for three years. And I see this patient in Ghent and the gentleman at that time was 27 years and he complained of a slow decrease in visual acuity. And he said to me, he said, doctor, you know, people, I work for a, a fancy fair and people call me crazy because they always think that I'm drunk because I, I don't have good balance. And I have issues with sensitivity in my legs. And when I pushed him, he also told me he had no sense of smell. Next slide. So his best corrected visual acuity was six out of nine, which would translate into 2030 for the Americans. It would translate for the Belgians and Europeans into something like seven, eight, ten. Um, and what I noticed when I was this young guy, I said, but this gentleman, I can't get his pupils open. He's got very small pupils. And through the small pupils, I was able to see that his retina in the periphery did not look normal at all. Next slide, please. And these are his pupils after we put in bucket loads of uh, dilating drops. And you can still see that they're pinpoint. And you have to accept from me that the structure of these pupils, of this iridis, sorry, the iris in both eyes is quality-wise not what it should be. Next slide, please. And this is a photograph taken through the very tiny pupils, which is therefore a bad photograph. But to describe it to you, it shows that the retina is abnormal in this 27-year-old gentleman. And it looks like the beginning of RP. Um, next slide. And then I told him, because I trained as a geneticist, I said, can, do you have anything else? Can I see your hands? And may, many of you may not see because the small size of the photograph, but he had an abnormal middle finger nail, which was far too um, short on his right hand. And his thumbs were stubby with very short nails. And then I said, can I see your feet? And the gentleman said, yeah, people always have laughed because of my feet. 
And I said, can I see them? And what you see on the slide is basically a short fourth toe, uh, which and a short first toe. And I still, I said to myself, hang on. I mean, I didn't know what it was, but I do realize, I did realize this was more than, than what I was supposed to know about retinitis pigmentosa and syndromes. I said, this gentleman has an original syndrome I don't know the name of. Next slide. And uh, we can go through it. At the end of the day, he was diagnosed with Refsum disease. He had very bad electroretinography responses, which means that his retina didn't work well. He had retinitis pigmentosa. And his serum phytanic acid, which is the phytanic acid in the blood, was sky high. But I didn't know that then. So this is me prior to me going to um, England for my extra training in eye genetics. Next slide. Next slide. And this is patient two in my life. Here I am in England training with Professor Bird and this 28 years old woman in the clinic of Professor Bird is seen by me as, an, as a fellow, which is an extra training that you do. And this is Professor Bird. He was a god. He still is a god in ophthalmic genetics. And this lady said to me, um, hi, how are you? And he, she was diagnosed uh, with a condition called adult refsum disease. I didn't know what it was. Um, and she was very talkative and a very nice young lady. And she said, Dr. Leroy, nice to meet you. Do you want to see my feet? And I said, why do I want to see your feet? I'm in an eye clinic. And she said, well, everyone always wants to see my feet when, you, when I come in with Professor Bird. So I said, yes, yeah, sure. And I also spoke to her and she said, I have balance problems and I don't smell well. And I said, okay. And something lit up in my brain, in my memory. Next slide. And she, she didn't have normal vision. She had clear retinitis pigmentosa, but her pupils did dilate. Next slide. And this is a slide showing the back of the eye in the right eye and in the left eye. What you see is problems in the middle of the sharp vision point but many more problems in the periphery where she has a classic sign of retinitis pigmentosa. Next slide. And we can see that on a fluorescein angiogram. We don't do them often, but we did though in those days. Next slide. And these are her hands, which are normal, except for a short stubby thumb. And these are her feet. And what I said, what I saw, made me say, hang on. And I told this lady, I said, I have a person in Ghent, your age, that because of you inviting me to look at your feet, I now have the diagnosis in my Ghent patient. So I went back to, to patient one. He was traveling around the country with a fancy fare with no fixed address. So I had to have the police involved and I had the police involved and I traced the guy and I said, you have to come in to again. We need to do phytanic acid. I think I have your diagnosis. You need to go on a diet. And this is the lady who made me realize what adult refsum disease was. I'm exceptionally thankful to her up to this day. Obviously she's in England. I don't follow her anymore. My colleagues do. Next slide. But it is a story that really has to tell you something. So this lady obviously also has high phytanic acid and she had some stabilization of the electrical activity under a, a disease treatment that is called plasmapheresis. We'll talk about that later on. Next slide. And these are traces that show uh, that the patient has essentially still some function going. Uh, and because of the treatment of the dietary restrictions, but also the plasmapheresis, she thinks, but she obviously also did diet, um, the evolution of disease was slower. Next slide. 
So um, essentially, uh, over time, I traced old traces e expressing function of the retina over time, going back to 90 and going into 2001. These were old traces, but I showed looking at the traces that when as soon as the treatment in this lady kicked in, she stabilized over time in her retinal function. Next slide. Now let's look at patient three. And again, this is an English patient whom I saw during my training years with Professor Bird in London. She's a 29 year old lady and she had a moderate decrease uh, in visual acuity since she was about 24, 25. And she told me when I pushed her because I knew much more about um, Refsum disease then, I asked her about her feet and about her hands and she had stubby thumbs and she said she had unsuccessfully worn braces for the displacement of her fourth toe with the fourth toe sitting a little bit on the backside of the of the foot um, and this was unsuccessful but people didn't know what she had and so they tried to do their best to try and correct this for her when she was a little child. Um, she did mentioned that after a delivery of one of her children, she lost the sense of smell and taste completely, and it's never come back. Next slide. She's the middle of three uh, people, uh, and they all have a Refsum disease uh, in the family, unfortunately, for the three in the SIP ship. Um, and there's another condition in the family that I won't be talking about. Next slide. Um, this is her. Her pupils do dilate a little bit better, but ver to be very descriptive, the peripheral part of her colored bit of the eye, of the iris, is darker, and that is actually because of atrophy. Her best corrected visual acuity is about half or a third, half in the right eye, a third of what it should be in the left eye. Next slide. And these are fundus pictures showing the back of the eye in the right eye showing that there's quality loss not only in the periphery of the retina but also in the middle uh, of the retina and that is why her vision central vision is not normal next slide and again showing abnormal stubby thumbs uh, on pictures of the extremities and showing that fourth digit on the foot sitting and on a little bit on the back of the foot. And this is because of the root bone of the fourth ray of that foot being exceptionally short compared to the other ones. And that's why the fourth toe, the extreme part of the toe is actually sitting a little bit on the dorsum or backside of the foot. Next slide. And she also had high phytanic acid. Next slide. Let's look at, a, um, at the traces. I'm not going to go on into that. Next slide. Uh, let's talk about the fourth and last patient that I want to uh, go over with you. This is a lady I saw 39, at age 39. The diagnosis had been made by the time I saw the person at the age of 24 again. And again, this lady had problems far beyond before that time. Uh, a slow decrease in visual acuity and vision balance issues and then she had a serious issue uh, in the lower extremities because she had to have an operation on the chin during which she had um, limited amounts of food and having limited amounts of food in adult refsum disease is an issue. Why is that? If you go hypocaloric, that is you don't eat enough calories your fat tissue is going to be burned. Even though you can be a slim person, you still have fat tissue available to you when you start to starve. That is, you start having too little food intake. What you do is you mobilize those fat parts, the, the fat from your body, but within the fat gets stored phytanic acid in adult Refsum disease. So what you do as you use the fat stores, you actually bring in enormous amounts 
of phytanic acid in your serum, in your blood, and you go for acute toxicity because your nerves do not like that at all. And this person had that issue. Uh, people didn't, didn't know and so didn't care and she didn't get enough food intake. And that's a drama. It took her a year to get over that period, this acute crisis of toxicity. She also had anosmia, which is the name, the official name for the fact that there's no sense of smell. Next slide. She had subnormal vision in the right eye and normal vision in the left eye when I got to know her. And she also had meiosis. Next slide. Meiosis is the small pupil. And from the slides that I'm showing uh, here uh, on, are the fundus pictures. What you see is the central part of the retina is fairly normal. The peripheral part shows typical signs of retinitis pigmentosa. Next slide. And the normal curve of dark adaptometry is um, shown in this slide and the patient's curve is far higher. In normal human language, what this means is that this person didn't have night vision. Next slide. The Goldman visual fields show that there is concentric constriction of the visual field in normal language, tunnel vision. Next slide. And the hands were normal, but the feet showed on one side, again, a short fourth toe sitting on the dorsum or back of the foot. Next slide. So the clinical data of this patient did show, again, a high phytanic acid. There was a, a, a DNA diagnosis at the level of the gene. She initially had stabilization of the function of the retina under strict dietary measures, but then had progression of disease despite the, tri the trial and error with the diet. Next slide. And next slide. And this is far too small for many of you to see, but it helps me to say the essential bits of the study in 12 people. And iris atrophy was seen in 75, abnormalities of the retina were seen in most, uh, skeletal abnormalities as well, that is hands and feet mostly. Anosmia was also present in um, about a th two thirds of the patients and meiosis or small pupils were also a very important uh, issue. Hearing loss was present in a smaller amount of people in the population that we looked at. This may be due to the fact that they were actually fairly young compared to um, people I saw later on. Next slide. Um, the results of this study show a variable expressivity of disease, which means when you look at two patients, these two patients will have overlap in what they show, but they won't be identical. It varies from one person to the other in between families, but also within one family. There's moderate to severe bilateral retinal degeneration um, in these people. And there's a relatively slow evolution of disease when the phytanic acid is controlled. Uh, two patients have shown that stabilization of the retinal function is possible to attain when a strict diet is adhered to. Next slide. So I saw since another seven extra patients with Refsum disease, which probably makes me one of the eye doctors having seen more of the patients than many in the world. And this is just by chance because I came across this lady in Alan Bird's clinic and Professor Bird's patient, uh, the lady who was kind enough to tell me that I had to look at her feet uh, and uh, therefore I could go back to my original patient whom I knew had something special, but I couldn't name it because I was naive uh, and didn't know about the diagnosis. So what I'm showing here is the variability of disease on this slide, mentioning seven extra patients I've seen since. And this is a lady, 41 years old, who had normal feet, but the 
a root bone in the hand and I'm showing my hand, this would be the root bone where I'm indicating it. And she has a short root bone as shown on a radiograph next to the clinical picture that you see, uh, showing that it's shorter and therefore that fourth finger is not normal. She has classic retinitis pigmentosa. Next slide. The special uh, diet is the essence of the treatment. Um, phytanic acid uh, is present in all products from ruminants. Ruminants are animals, for those of you who are not um, English speaking um, as a mother tongue, ruminants are those animals that um, eat uh, a couple of times what they've swallowed, like cows actually. Uh, and virtually all products of cows contain high levels of phytanic acid, which means milk, cheese, uh, meat, um, yogurt, uh, whatever you want to talk about. There are other sources of phytanic acid that you can also reduce in a diet. And this is the mainstay of what we need to do for those patients. Um, the plasmapheresis is, is sometimes advocated for. Uh, plasmapheresis is cleaning of the plasma through a filter. It's basically cleaning your blood from phytanic acid. Some people advocate in favor of it, but personally, I'm not necessarily a fan. I am a fan of that when there is an acute problem with too high phytanic acid, but I am not um, uh, very much a fan of it at this present time when the patient can control much through the diet. Follow-up by cardiologists is essential um, and eye doctors can help as well. Next slide. And next slide, we conclude that Refsum disease is rare. It's a variable disease. An early diagnosis enables therapy, which is mostly the diet, to reverse life-threatening complications. The rod cone dystrophy, also known as retinitis pigmentosa, is moderate to severe. Early treatment may be effective in limiting the disease progression in the eye. Next slide. And with this, um, I want to really thank all the people online. I'm showing a picture of the four people who made an essential contribution to my career, uh, from Professor Delay on the left, who trained me as an eye doctor, Professor Holder, um, who was the electrophysiologist who taught me everything I need to know about function of the eye, Professor Bhattacharya, who taught me everything about genes, and Professor Bird, who taught me everything I needed to know about genetic eye disease. Next slide. Um, running an ophthalmic genetics service is not something you do alone. Um, you don't necessarily need to do it with women. I do realize that on this slide, I'm the only man and all the rest are women. Uh, this is not deliberate. Uh, you have to believe me. Uh, all my colleagues work with me to make sure that the ocular genetics team in Ghent is there for all the patients with diseases like Refsum disease. Next slide, please. And the same is true uh, for the Philadelphia ocular genetics team. Uh, you see me with Emma Bedukian, our genetic counselor, and you see Dr. Tomas Alaman, my friend and colleague, as well as Drs. McGuire and Bennett, the father and the mother of ocular gene therapy. Uh, with this, I'm open to questions and thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Bart. Uh, that was a great presentation. I'm always learning something new from you uh, every time I talk with you or listen to you talk. Uh, that was great. So now we're gonna move on to the questions. I'm gonna actually stop sharing so that you guys can see us in, in larger, larger form. Uh, so I've got a couple questions so far uh, in the Q&A uh, box. So let me talk to those. Uh, there's a question on, do you perform an OCT in Refson disease? So um, this is from, I can see the question from Udo Henichhausen. So thank you, Udo, for the question. Yes, we do, obviously. And one reason why, um, and again, you'll see how old I am. Uh, one reason why I didn't uh, shove in 
uh, OCTs is because on the patients that I mostly showed, I don't have many OCTs because it was done before the OCT came into clinical practice. I have not deliberately wanted to include more recent information because I am worried about patient identification, but surely, Udo, I use OCT. OCT, for those not in the know, is an optical coherence tomography. It basically is like an ultrasound of a baby, the unborn baby in the belly of his mum or her mum. And we use infrared light or near infrared light to make a similar scan of the retinal structure. And so we can see the different layers to a certain extent, not in detail, but to a certain extent, we can surmise which part of the retina is which type of cell. And so, yes, absolutely necessary to do OCTs. I, 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 I definitely want to do them. I do them on a regular basis. Great. Thank you, Bart. Uh, so the next one, so uh, we have, uh, they're thanking you for the wonderful talk, uh, but also would ask, would the diagnosis of adult rough sum uh, is an option for a young male, 23 years of age, who came to my clinic and found to have a, a macular dystrophy and ichthyosis mainly? So this is a question by my friend Basamat al Moalem, who is a doctor from Saudi Arabia and trained with us. So Basamat, yes, absolutely. I think you need to entertain that. I do know that asking in a, an ophthalmic clinic, asking a patient, can I see your hands? And surely asking, can I see your feet is not something you do often. I would certainly try and do that, Basamat. Um, and I think doing phytanic acid in Riyadh where you're based is easy. Uh, I would certainly do so. Um, I think that the combination could be um, within the spectrum of Refsum disease. And adult Refsum disease, because of the fact that it is fairly treatable with diet, is so important that the little cost for phytanic acid, you need to double check which lab does it in Riyadh, but I'm sure you do, uh, you will find one, is so um, incredibly cheap compared to what you can do for the patient. So please do so. Yeah, and then he also goes on to say, on the other hand, I have another patient who was referred with uh, a diagnosis of Usher syndrome with further genetic assessment. P the PEC6 mutation was identified and the Hemler syndrome, part of the proxosomal disorders, was made based on their clinical data and Refsum was excluded for, with normal PHYH. Uh, acid, yeah. Titanic so, acid, yeah. So... Uh, so Basamat, she's a lady actually, Chrissy, but you could yeah. know. Oh, sorry. So that's <laughs> fine. So Basamat, yes. Um, so for, for the listeners to, to uh, break that open a little bit. So there are um, the, the issue I didn't mention that in adult resum disease is a peroxisomal issue. And peroxisomes are small inclusions in the cell that, uh, for example, um, do the degeneration of phytanic acid, um, and that's phytanoyl coenzyme A hydroxylase needs to do that. They basically break down fatty acids from the food that we uh, swallow, uh, so that the food that the products coming out of the peroxisomes can then be entered into what is called the mitochondria, other inclusions, and. The other inclusions, mitochondria, make cellular petrol or ATP from those degenerate products coming off the peroxisomes. So the peroxisomal diseases in general um, are conditions that you can divide up into problems with an enzyme working in the peroxisomes and that doesn't do its job. Or you can see peroxisomal disease that is due to structural proteins that make the little inclusions called peroxisomes. So if you don't make that little bladder within the cell that is called a peroxisome, you basically can't house the substances like phytanoyl coenzyme A that needs to accumulate within the peroxisome to make it work. And so you don't have the house to go and work in the house. Um, and so, for example, uh, other uh, conditions such as PEC6 uh, which is known for other peroxisomal conditions, 
uh, is, is very much a, a condition that overlaps with adult refsum disease. And I don't think Basamad, I'll need to teach you much. You, you know a lot about this. And then the next question is from Carrie Branham, I see. So Carrie is a friend of mine from Michigan. Um, so do you know reason? Do you know a reason why you see meiosis in these patients? Carrie, I can be short. The answer is no. Uh, my the only thing I can philosophize about is that the dilator muscle in the um, in the uh, in the iris is atrophic with the with the iris. That's what I think, but we've not uh, we don't have any pathology, so we we're not sure. And the next question is from Claudette Medefind. Uh, could you please give us a few specific questions to pose to our patients to check? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for asking, Claudette. Um, first question: Do you smell correctly? Do you have a problem with your sense of smell? The second thing, can I see your hands and feet, please? Uh, these are exceptionally important. Also, do you have any balance issues? And it, certainly if it's a patient over 25, ask whether there's a problem with sensory neural hearing loss. Do they have a problem with hearing? One of my patients had an acute and total failure of hearing in one ear, six years later, had the same thing in the other ear. And you can imagine with a debilitating disease such as retinitis pigmentosa, if you're a professional like that gentleman is, all of a sudden uh, losing your hearing is completely changing your life. So that person had successfully so a cochlear implant. Now that makes me realize one thing, probably, the disease at the level of the ears is at the level of the organ of corti, which is the place where hair cells in your inner ear translate movements of your eardrum uh, that is sound into electrical signals. Because you connect up a cochlear implant onto the auditory nerve, I, from, from this patient's case, have learned that the nerve works because he could hear again with the implant and that it probably is the inner ear that is affected. But to go back, Claudette, ask about smell, look at hands and feet, ask for balance, ask for hearing. And then probably from Romania, UNESCO Andrea, thank you for the webinar. Would like to ask you if you recommend the surgical follow-up uh, for surgical treatment for the feet hand abnormalities. So I don't recommend surgery on the hand and feet abnormalities. I can be completely uh, disavowed on this by my patients, uh, by patients on the online, but I don't think that the balance issues that they have are due to these abnormalities. They are not debilitating, they're not beautiful, but on the other hand, hey, come on, we all have something. Um, and I wouldn't, I would certainly not do surgery. During surgery, exceptionally important during major surgery. And that's what I did for one of my patients who had a cardiomyopathy and had a heart transplant for Refsum disease, heart disease. I talked to the intensive care specialist and I told them, do not go hypocaloric, overfeed the gentleman in your infusions. Don't go hypocaloric because he will, he will have an acute toxicity by mobilizing phytanic acid stores. Um, and uh, so um, uh, Andrea is the first name I assume, I hope that has answered. Um, and then Claudette, how many genes are implicated in Refsum disease? Basically for adult Refsum disease, we think one mainly. Um, uh, the jury is still out, uh, but one mainly, phytanic acid coenzyme A hydroxylase. Uh, there's overlap with other peroxisomal disorders, uh, and most of the labs now will test for a peroxisomal gene panel. So Zellweger syndrome, infantile Refsum disease, um, X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy, they're all peroxisomal, and they will all be tested on these gene panels. 
Um, Udo Hennighausen says, I saw a patient with a very shallow anterior chamber, a thick lens and glaucoma. Unfortunately, I didn't follow the patient. So Udo, um, I can tell you that one of our patients also had a shallow anterior chamber and we had to do um, iridotomies for it. Uh, in normal human language, the part between a transparent hourglass of the, of the eye, which is called the cornea and the iris, is called the anterior chamber. And when it is shallow, that is not deep enough, there's a risk that the anterior chamber angle 360 degrees around where the liquid flows out of the eye gets clogged up and you get a high pressure. And so what you can do is actually um, make an extra pupil at the level of 12 o'clock, which is covered by your upper eyelid. And then you have a free movement of liquid and less of a problem. So Jacqueline Turner has a question. What percentage of patients are missed on genetic screening? Thank you for a wonderful, clear presentation. Thank you, Jacqueline, uh, with pleasure. So what percentage of patients are missed on genetic screening? I can tell you that uh, traditionally, um, uh, the move, the, the move of, of what is ocular genetics these days and genetics in general is such that people are going away from testing for one gene. So we now have, we send in a DNA sample of a patient. And if you ask, for example, we can test all the genes for retinal disease in Ghent. And on the panel of genes that are being tested when you ask for the test also sits phytanic acid uh, so phytanoyl coenzyme I hydroxylase gene, the PHYH uh, gene. Um, so I get back the result immediately. I don't think that many people are actually missed, but Jacqueline, I get, I, I understand you're probably a clinician. I am a very critical clinician. If I see a clinical image or phenotype that fits the bill of retinal disease, I'll go back to the panel when it comes negative, back negative, and I'll go back and see whether I can have another test done that potentially has um, the, the gene onto it. So I, I will always double check. Sometimes people miss uh, mutations, do understand that. And so be critical. Um, any advice for patients with Resum, uh, Resums and Meniere disease? Um, um, that's a tough one. Um, Meniere is a horror story. Um, I don't have a good um, comment to make apart from try to control as much as you can because I think the Meniere disease, which is a, a disease where you, you basically go crazy because you feel dizzy, um, I, I personally believe this is due to toxicity, as is the eye problem, the, ear, the hearing problem. This is toxicity at the level of the semicircular canals, which help us uh, at the level of balance. And so I think if you try and control as much as you can in your diet, um, the uh, phytanic acid, you're probably doing well. Uh, and for the rest, I would say, if you're not satisfied with the ENT surgeon helping you, go see another one. You need university level, high class care. Adult Refsum disease is for people who give high class care. Understand as patients that you will be teaching most of the doctors you come across. And there's nothing wrong with that. The doctors don't know all conditions. Typical of, 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 of a rare disease, is that you basically have to teach um, doctors as a patient. And that's fine, your partners in crime. Thank you, uh, Bart. I think that ends our questions. Uh, you know, I really want to thank you, Bart, for your presentation and answering all the questions. Uh, I would also like to thank the participants for joining today to learn more about Refsum's disease. Uh, hopefully, as Bart said, we'll get uh, additional patients diagnosed earlier. It would make a tremendous difference um, in their lives. Um, and thanks for your questions as well. Uh, well, that ends today's webinar and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.